Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about military carbon emissions. How can we stop them from rising? So I will begin. Um, if I can get my slides to move. <laughs> this is where the technical problems take over. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can see all that. How do we? How do militaries and war increase carbon emissions? So. Um, the military carbon footprint, some of you will have seen this diagram before, um, gives a, a um, brief um, overview of how militaries cause carbon emissions. Um, um, the most immediate and obvious ways are in things like the, the burning fuels in warships, warplanes, armored vehicles, um, equipment use in general on military bases, and then the huge supply chains that supply them. And then on the right of the diagram, all the impacts when a war breaks out. So um, in terms of data on how big military carbon emissions are, it's very poor, but there have been a few estimates. Here's um, some estimates for the um, carbon emissions of NATO and for European members of NATO and for the Ukraine war. Um, you can see they're up into the hundreds of millions of tonnes of carbon. Um, these are conservative estimates based on, on arms industry data, which in many ways is incomplete. But this data is showing that, that NATO's carbon footprint, for example, has increased over 15% in two years. This is just the um, um, emissions from the military um, industrial um, system and, and the, the militaries themselves. It doesn't include war impacts. Um, and you can see that um, one year's emissions from the Ukraine war in blue in the center of the graph um, is similar to the whole of, of European NATO emissions in one year. And then reconstruction um, following a war um, is nearly as much again. Um, if we look at a global level of military carbon footprint, this is a piece of research that SGR led. Um, and we estimated that the global military carbon footprint was about 5.5% of global carbon emissions. Um, if it were a country, it would be bigger than Russia. Um, and um, again, there's a wide uncertainty range in this, and it's incomplete in that there are no war impacts um, involved, included in this estimate. Um, but that's not the complete picture. Um, for example, in the war in Ukraine, um, there are wider impacts on carbon emissions due to the um, um, emissions that are generated through a shift in energy supply. So moving away from Russian gas um, supplied through pipeline to um, um, a greater use of liquefied natural gas, LNG, which is higher carbon, um, often um, supplied through fracking. Um, and there, there's some projections there of, um, of emissions um, due to the increase in, in LNG capacity um, that, that's been spurred by the um, um, Ukraine war. And then you've got military expansion following that, and um, you've got um, then, then there's even further emissions rises within a na national economy. So, for example, um, there's some new research just come out from an Italian university, which has shown that military emissions, um, military spending, when military spending increases, it leads to um, an emissions rise in the wider national economy. Um, is there a problem with the sound? If, if whoever's hasn't muted, can they turn their mute? Can they mute their um, mute their sound so that we can get rid of the feedback? Um, I shall carry on anyway. So, what measures are likely to reduce um, emissions from military and conflict? Um, there are a number of options. The military preference is lower carbon weapon systems, um, a range of technologies there, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there are a range of alternatives as well. Obviously, the most obvious one, reducing armed conflict and war um, and um, other measures, reducing measures to um, reduce peacetime military activities, especially long range or large scale ones. 
um, and then a whole range of, of policy measures, um, things like current common security approaches, disarmament treaties, reducing military spending, and I'll talk um, more about those in a second. So the lower carbon military technologies, um, this is the only approach considered within uh, military climate strategies. So an example is the UK Ministry of Defence um, climate um, strategy. It's seek where, where they say we seek to use the green transition to add to military capabilities. So they're, they're talking about in, improving performance on the battlefield by the use of green technologies. Um, the um, Americans put it a bit more bluntly, more fight, less fuel. Um, and these are using technologies, um, a range of technologies from uh, increasing the fuel efficiency of various mobile technologies, warplanes, warships, but also things like biofuels, synthetic fuels in military planes, more drones, more nuclear power on warships and at bases, um, and then, then a range of other measures, solar panels and insulation on, at bases, but also some of the more controversial, some of the especially controversial measures like carbon offsets. Um, and, and counting forestry projects against military emissions. Will these actually reduce emissions? Well, this is a subject of, of research that SGR is, is um, investigating at the moment. These are, are some of our early um, indications. And, and one of the things that's very clear about this sector is um, in the civilian sector, there are a number of uh, in the civilian economy. There are a number of sectors that are labeled hard to abate aviation, shipping, um, heavy duty road transport, iron and steel um, and chemicals. And these are all cornerstones of military technologies. Um, so we have a situation here where you're taking the hardest to evade civilian technologies, putting them in a military context so they're even more energy intensive and then trying to decarbonize that. And that's extremely difficult to do um, through technological measures alone. And I've put up some of the, the obstacles here um, for a range of these technologies and, and the problems. And we'll be publishing more about this in, in the coming months. Um, what about reducing peacetime military activities? Well, here, here there are some obvious options, things like reducing foreign military bases because of the high carbon involved in supplying those bases, long distances, heavy use of aircraft. The US has the most foreign bases by far of any nation. Um, low estimates put it around 130. High estimates put it around 800. Um, the difference between the estimates tends to be, how do you define a base? Is it, is it uh, sometimes a base is a number of sites and etc. So you, you get into complex arguments about what the definition of a base is. But anyway, it's a considerable number. Um, few nations have anything like that. Britain and Russia are probably the, the countries that have the greatest um, number of, of bases outside the US, and they have between 10, 10 and 20 large bases. Um, but as I say, the actual numbers remain unclear. There's also the importance of reducing major military exercises. These are very carbon intensive. I've put some figures there from the, the latest NATO military exercise, the latest Chinese military exercise, um, and the number of ships and aircraft involved. Um, that there's an example also from the UK, the, the um, carrier strike group that was sent on a global voyage um, a few years ago, just that one round the world voyage with 11 ships led to a 25% rise in naval fuel use that year, um, shows you a, a considerable impact. Um, and then there's the broader issues around policies that, that really diffuse conflict, common security policies, disarmament reductions in military spending. So common security is, is something um, that really should be a term that should, really should be more widely known, more widely understood. It's about um, mutual respect for security considerations of all nations and groups looking for win-win approaches through diplomacy and negotiation and using bodies such as the United Nations and dispute um, resolution mechanisms like the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, and also arms control treaties and non-offensive defense strategies. And all these things can help improve the conditions for reductions in the number and capability of, of the highest carbon, longish range um, military technologies and also help to reduce, mil uh, reduce military spending 
and and um, as I've said, the, the way that's related to um, greenhouse gas emissions. So will these uh, um, reduce emissions? Um, in this case, there's historical data that shows clearly that they do. After the end of the Cold War, um, we saw some major reductions in US and UK emissions. Uh, there's virtually no data on the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but they were probably even larger. So there, there's clear evidence that these do work. Um, and they also could release a lot of money in military spending. And, and the graph on the left shows you the, the global climate shortfall and how um, a switch of some military spending could help us fill that and, and magnify the government spending on, on um, tackling climate change, and which is sorely needed. And the graph on the right is just um, an indication of the way that militarism um, helps protect a, a global economic system that is grossly unfair, grossly unequal, and leads to um, and allows overconsumption, high consumption, but, uh, and the high pollution from the, the richest um, sections of society. So you have a situation now where about the 10% of the world's richest um, people are. Um, responsible for about 50% of the world's emissions. A few glimmers of hope to end with. Um, one, the, the, the ones I've summarized here are at a, a national level or an international level. Um, I, I should also point out there's an awful lot of campaigning initiatives that are, uh, are going on as well, but um, a few um, at governmental level. Um, the issue is being raised much more in, in UNFCC discussions um, proposed by countries like U Ukraine, Georgia, Palestine. And um, we're seeing a global number of, of military um, carbon emission strategies. Um, I've given you lots of criticisms why they're inadequate, but it is important that we have them and, and we improve upon them. Um, and we're seeing a lot of resistance to militaristic strategies. We've just had the UN Pact for the Future, which has a whole range of peace building and, and, and um, common security measures within it. Um, we're seeing um, increasing arms embargoes on Israel with, with what ha what's happened um, through its um, wars at the moment and, and various cases taken through the ICJ, the ICC against Israel and, and Russia and, and the various individuals in, involved in those cases and, and Hamas as well, um, and the importance of pursuing those options. And, and also the countries are, are sta standing outside military alliances and, and uh, as um, the examples of Austria, Ireland and Switzerland in, in Europe. Um, and disarmament efforts as well. We shouldn't forget the climate threat from nuclear weapons. And, and um, so the nuclear ban treaty, the TPNW is really important to reduce that threat. Um, and, and I'll finish with um, the example of Costa Rica, which abolished its military in 1949 and diverted its, um, m the money to social and environmental programs. And there's a bit of inspiration for all of us in, in that visionary um, step. 